And um, so uh, welcome to uh, this morning's Stormwater Awareness Week uh, with uh, Craig Kalaji. He did present this yesterday, but if you saw this yesterday, don't go away because uh, he's added new information and, and, and it'll be a, a little bit different than yesterday. Uh, so we are glad that you are here. And uh, so uh, my name is John Taraskis. I am um, going to become it's the silent host. I'll be watching the chat and I'll be in questions to Craig. But Craig, why don't you um, introduce yourself, tell Great. everybody a little bit about yourself and then go ahead and go on to your presentation. Correct. Well, thank you, John, and welcome, everybody. Uh, bright Friday morning here. And uh, my background is uh, actually that doctorate is in plant pathology. I was the farm advisor and county director in Santa Clara County for a good number of years and got involved with recycled organics way back then in uh, San Jose in partnership with agriculture in diverting organics from the major cities into the agricultural area. Well, now we're faced with some even bigger challenges uh, with a, a bill called Senate Bill 1383 where we are gonna be diverting up to 75% by 2025 is the goal of our organics away from landfills towards more beneficial uses. And uh, the reason for this is uh, carp, uh, the uh, short-lived climate pollutants like methane, which are produced when we bury these organics has become a major problem and an issue. Uh, our landfills are the largest contributors to methane uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. And so in its wisdom, the state of California said, we're gonna do our part to minimize that. So today what we're gonna be talking about is a tool, compost blankets, and why they have to be such a major part of this solution towards global warming and carbon sequestration. So I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, I work for San Pasquale Valley Soils. I am the uh, business development and sustainability manager for them. And also we're members of the, uh, and I'm on, on the board of directors for the Association of Compost Producers. Now I'm gonna be doing a bit of a slide blitzkrieg for you today, a lot of slides, but they're pictures. I wanna visually uh, show you and not just tell you about uh, what's going on in the world of compost, compost blankets. San Pasquale Valley Soils is a compost, composting operation located in San Diego County in the beautiful San Pasquale Valley Agricultural Preserve. This is, uh, 14,000 acres that were reserved for agriculture and it's owned by the city of San Diego and it's actually much the watershed's much larger but it protects and sits on top of a huge supply of water for the city of San Diego and therefore uh, has for decades been a resource that's deeply valued and and protected and so we're a part of that and we go back to 1962 in the Frank Conine dairy which was one of 250 dairies in San Diego County at the time. Now it's one of two that are left. That shows you what's happened to agriculture in these urbanized areas. It's one of two, it's the largest dairy. We have about 2000 head of cattle. And because of that, the, uh, we are able to utilize some of this uh, resource, what, what I'd like to call a bioresource of cow manure. And we are the only providers of uh, actual manure based compost as well as uh, typically a landscape uh, feedstock base. So we use cow manure and landscape feedstock to produce our compost. And we have a number of products and we're gonna be talking, those products you're gonna be seeing that go into a compost blanket are the products that we provide. So uh, let's go to the US EPA's definition of what a compost blanket is. It's a loosely, uh, a layer of loosely applied composted material. Uh, a blanket is just something laid over the surface of something. And in this case, uh, it, it's a, a loose material, usually one to two inches in depth. And it focuses on source control rather than sediment control. Erosion is the detachment of a soil particle and that blanket sits on top of that soil and prevents that from happening. And so it gets at the source of the problem. The sediment is after we've lost the, de or we detach that soil particle, we, that soil particle is moving, that becomes sediment. That's what you do with a sediment control BMP. And so both erosion control and sediment control are the keys to stormwater management. Um, BMPs to tr 
truly be the best must be sustainable management practice. And what do we mean by that? We hear that term thrown around. Well, it's a practice that meets the, our present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And it requires a preventative and proactive environmental design and management rather than reactive end of pipe solutions. The interesting thing about sustainability is what are you sustaining? And we're gonna be talking about how compost uh, regenerates, literally restores the biology and the health of, of soil that we are trying to sustain. So if we sustain something, we want it to be the best it can be. So it's, it's not just sustainability that we're managing, we're managing the regenerative quality of the environment that we live in so that it can truly meet the needs of future generations. So biomimicry then becomes a foundation for this because it's what nature does naturally, has done for millions of years. The, it's an uh, approach toward environmental problem solving and product innovation and site design that, require, that looks at no waste, that we look at particularly as it relates to stormwater biofiltration and water absorption. And this is particularly true when we do post-fire remediation of fire damaged soils. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, coming up. Green infrastructure, habitat creation, growing things. There's nothing better than plant, plants growing in that soil to hold that soil in place and prevent erosion. Native plant and animal maintenance, that biodiversity, which we're gonna talk about a little later uh, today at 12 noon, I'm gonna be giving a talk on compost and nutrient uh, availability and how this biodiversity plays a critical role in, in maintaining uh, the uh, health of, of the soil environment and obviously the plants that we depend on. And then restoring natural carbon cycles is carbon sequestration that I already alluded to and the ability to store carbon back and rebalance our environment simply by managing our soils. So let's look at a natural system. And what you'll notice first of all in that very top layer is the organic matter itself is nature's way of composting. When we compost, we are truly are mimicking nature. We're just trying to speed the process up and then we're directing the byproducts of composting towards beneficial environmental and ecosystem services like water conservation, water quality, what have you. And this is the way nature has maintained the quality of life on this planet for millions of years. So this is what we're trying to mimic. And if you look at a hydrology uh, model, of a natural system like a forest moving to the, to the right, uh, at least as I look at the screen, hopefully you're seeing the same thing. You notice the pollutant load goes up as we move away from a natural system to a more constructed, designed, uh, impervious uh, system of cities, concrete, asphalt, and what have you. This immediately leads to water impairment, and, and this is why 75% of the bodies of water are impaired in some way here in the United States. And it's something that we can fix when we start to mimic nature. We have natural capital in the environment and it's a stock material within the environment that we rely on to provide the steady flow of services necessary to maintain economic, environmental, and human health. In short, to be, allow us to restore and regenerate our environment. Compost is a capital that's extremely important to our survival. There is no singular solution to declining soil and water quality, but this tool, compost, something as simple as decomposed organic matter, uh, uh, and this recycled organic has, is the most versatile organic material, and particularly when we certify it and we know what we're working with. Compost utilization permits the watershed managers, and we're all living in a watershed, to leverage the power of the soil and water connection to maintain the quality of that watershed. So what is a certified compost? Why do I specify certified? Well, because it's important that we know what we're talking about when we talk about compost. It's a very broad term and it means a lot of different things and not all compost is created equal. A mixture of organic matter from landscape uh, waste, food waste, animal manures that is decayed and has been digested by organisms been laboratory tested to meet minimum standards of quality and is used to improve water filtration, infiltration, soil structure, and biology. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in the U.S. Composting Council's STA program uh, 
later on in the uh, presentation. So let's look at the two big tools that you have available for water management with compost and compost blankets. The one on the left actually uh, is the coarse, what we call a coarse material. Both of these are compost, believe it or not. We typically think of the finer material, the one on the right, the growing media as compost, but in fact, the coarse material was screened from that to get the fine material. We, we typically screen the coarse material and that truly is compost, but it, it serves a very different purpose when it comes to management of stormwater. It's designed to filter water and in many cases in working with growing media to uh, maintain and stabilize the finer material that we want to use in the blanket onto the so surface of the soil. So uh, again, certified, usually has to be a pH between five and eight. Particle size on the course is any, about 60%, about one to two inches in, in length. Uh, and it has to be pathogen and weed free, which is why you do the testing. This is nature's filtration system. This humus that's associated with, with compost and the organic matter, uh, each have been well documented in the scientific research as effective pollution filtration devices evaluated for sediment reduction, absorption, meaning absorbing of water and the adsorption, the adsorption of pollutants in water on the surface of the, of the organic material. And these, these uh, contaminants in soil and stormwater will be adsorbed to this organic matter. So primary applications are typically for sediment control on perimeters, can be used around inlet protection, uh, check dams to slow water down and filter it and to take that energy out of it, and then on slope interruption. We use these types of portable berms, if you will, in a sock system to, in, in conjunction with compost blankets to create sheet flow because we don't want a concentrated flow blowing our, our loosely constructed blanket on the surface of the soil down the slope. So we can use these at the, at the crown of the slope or at the toe of the slope and as well as slope interruption devices. Now let's get to the real crux of it. This is the this is the black gold that makes up a compost blanket. It's the, we really typically like to use a half inch minus uh, blended, depending on the slope angle, with some of the coarse material to create a blanket. And we're doing this to, bio, to mimic what nature would do. And you can see in erosion and sediment control, stormwater blankets play a big role. These are all different compost best management practices. And stormwater management is actually that ability, uh, that's where the compost blankets really, their absorptive quality, the ability to hold water, volume control of stormwater and infiltration become really important when it comes to stormwater management. And this is where blankets, uh, compost blankets really shine. And then restoration, remediation, feeding that biology and regenerating that soil. Let's look at the importance of not only on slopes, which compost blankets really shine, that's the superstar part is on a, on a slope, the thickness of the blanket, compost erosion control blanket, that's what the CECB means, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the angle, the slope angle, uh, four to one to two to one, four is the horizontal run, the one there is the vertical run. So the, uh, moving from a less sloped area or steep area down to a more sloped area, you'll notice that we tend to decrease the thickness of the blanket because this blanket will absorb a massive amount of water. One cubic foot of this fine material, this fine compost, will absorb four gallons of water. So the steeper the slope, the more you have to uh, account for the fact that that water absorption on the slope, if you get the blanket too thick, it will start to slough off and roll down the slope. So you tend to get a little thinner as we go uh, into a steep slope. If we go into a one-to-one -one slope, we'll probably even need to use something like a lockdown netting, and I'll show you that. So here's the beauty of compost erosion control blankets, is that they have that intimate contact with the ground, uh, and you eliminate puckering that's associated with other types of rolled erosion control blankets that you roll, and I'll show you a picture of that. Intimate contact reduces sediment loss. Water infiltration increases. 
What's one of the biggest things we've been pushing is rather than conveying stormwater now, we capture stormwater. We, have, we don't want that fresh water, that limited source of fresh water to end up going to the ocean. We want to capture as much of it as we can and infiltrate it and store it in the soil. That's the new paradigm. It also increases germination from seeds. And we, what do we say about vegetation as an erosion control uh, BMP? It is the best, you cannot beat it. A root system growing in soil is by far the best erosion control we can get. Water discharge from slopes. It decreases the, and reduces the potential for sediment loss. And then the organic matter improves the slope's ability to revegetate and establish this biodiversity, this permanent erosion control system that sustains itself over time. Here's an example of a slope. Uh, gravelly, very typical. A lot of the topsoil is gone, as you can tell. In, in fact, in many cases, we have very little to no good quality topsoil. So we're asking plants to establish themselves in a very harsh environment. Here's an example of how on slopes, typically a blanket is applied through a blower truck installation. These are trucks that uh, can blow bark, use it a lot on playground uh, restoration where you're blowing bark uh, at a playground and other materials. But in this case, they're blowing this half inch minus material on a slope. And when they blow it, they can add seed to the blower truck. So seed is being applied along with that blanket of half inch minus material. And here's six weeks after installation, and you got 100% coverage and literally no erosion coming off that. Here it is five years later. In this case, we've actually had some trees planted and uh, you have voluntary growth of new plant species. So now we're starting to see the encouragement of that biodiversity. And this is what it looks like when you cut a, cut a profile of that soil. Look at the contact. This is why blankets Compost blankets work so well. That loose blanket gets into every nook and cranny and really, uh, really stops the detachment of soil particles. Here's an example of a biodegradable rolled erosion control blanket. And this will certainly take some of the energy out of that uh, rain event. But once that water gets under the blanket, you lose that intimate contact and you can get uh, rilling underneath the blanket, moving it down, not to mention, does this blanket, as is, continue to support and feed the biology in that soil? Uh, it will, but very, very slowly. It's not in a, uh, as usable form uh, as compost, and the intimate contact is simply not there. So this is what we want to get. This is where we're going for in an ideal vegetated compost blanket. And you'll notice there the particle size is uh, just a little bit larger than uh, what you might get a 3 8 inch minus. Here it is in a situation where you have three treatments. On the right, you have just the blanket itself, which will do a very good job even if you don't have vegetation growing. It will absorb a tremendous amount of energy and water and infiltrate it down. In the middle, you have what happens when you don't provide that sort of natural cover. And very, very typical, nothing to slow it down, no erosion control. And on the left is your ideal where you've got the plants now being established, being fed by that blanket over a long term. It's a slow release of nutrients to establish optimum erosion control. Here's a project. I want to now go into some projects and show you um, actual uh, case studies. This was in San Diego on a high wall project that was 400 feet up in a quarry where it had for generations had been quarried. This was essentially rock. And the restoration biologist said, we, we have to try to get something to grow on this wall. And so we did a pilot study, which is something at, with my university training, I always like to do, a, this was seven acres. And I thought before we do something, let's find out if we can even get anything to grow. And lo and behold, we put a mix of natives in there and, and we were able to get something to grow. And you can see the coarse material I applied because they did not want to use guar to hold it on such as, this was a one-to-one -one slope. So what we did is we added about 30% coarse compost to the fine half inch minus, and we were able to get it to hold on the slope. And here they are scaling up on seven acres. You can't even see the person up there. He's on a harness being held by a stake as he blows about a one inch blanket with seed, native seed, 
on seven acres of high wall, 400 feet up. This, you look at the rocks in this quarry. This is one year later. We're starting to see some vegetation. Some of these natives take a while to get established. Two years later, we're starting to see a little bit more. Notice we also have an irrigation line in here. We were in the middle of a drought at the time, and we needed that irrigation to bring up the seed and get it established, or we were going to lose it due to just uh, natural degradation of the seed bank being exposed to UV radiation. So they irrigated it up. Here's a close-up of that vegetation, and just look at how thin that layer of compost is, and look what it's growing in. And this is at four years, uh, where we got really excellent natural native, these are all native, California natives, uh, established on that slope. So very successful. Uh, we don't like to use guar typically with a blanket, and I'll tell you why, it's because the guar is used a lot in hydro mulching and hydro seeding to glue the wood fibers to the surface and glue the soil particles together. And that's how it works. And it's a temporary erosion control process until you can get good landscape like this established. But that guar, when it's applied to a compost blanket, will actually, rather than allowing the rainfall to dissipate into the blanket and be infiltrated, it will sheet the water off the blanket, thereby negating the benefits of the blanket itself. So we tend to want to use a coarser material rather than a guar so that we don't de deter or degrade the ability of the blanket from absorbing the water. When we get into these one-to-one -one slope situations, it really gets tricky and there are other techniques. This is a Filtrex plastic lockdown netting. It's very similar to a turf reinforcement netting where you lay it down before the, um, before the actual uh, application, then you blow the, the compost into this blanket, which locks it in place. And here's what it looks like six weeks after. You got about 85% coverage. The, the netting is now locked underneath the blanket and stabilizing that material on that slope. This is about a two and a half, two and a half inches. Again, we don't like to get much deeper than two, two, three inches at max because it'll settle a little bit. Uh, otherwise, it'll absorb so much water, it'll, you'll start to see it slough off. Here it is nine months later. Uh, let's look now at the percent cover, vegetative cover with a compost blanket uh, produced from yard waste and hydro mulch in a silt fence. And you can see from the uh, data from Dr. Britt Fawcett, he did his PhD on this at the University of Georgia back some time. By the way, most of the research I'm showing you is Dr. Fawcett's, uh, did, he is truly the pioneer uh, and, and the guru of compost best management practices. And his data is, uh, is really demonstrates the effectiveness of, of these under very controlled scientific conditions. Here we have uh, a little over 62% vegetative cover on the yard waste. Uh, under the same growing conditions, uh, the hydro mulch about 21. Uh, and then as you go down, because you're getting more vegetative uh, establishment of the seed that you planted, you'll notice that your weed population, because of crowding out from the, the desired plants that you seeded, uh, you get less weed cover than you would with a hydro mulch silt fence application as well. So you get better plant establishment of what you want to grow there, as well as uh, you get less weeds in that established vegetation. Now let's look at the effectiveness of just the blanket with uh, compared to hydro mulching where uh, the time to run up start is 27 minutes with a compost blanket, nine minutes with hydro mulch. Why is that important? Because the longer you can prevent that runoff from occurring, the greater chance you have of minimizing any sort of soil loss. And so let's look at the total soil solids loss on these. Uh, and you'll notice the yard waste is considerably less soil loss, both one day and three months after uh, installation and application. So very effective, excellent results showing why that ability for that blanket to absorb moisture, support plant growth makes a difference. This rainfall absorption, if we compare it to bare soil, for example, this is a four inch per hour rain event for one year and look at the difference on bare soil 
on absorption, straw mulch, and a compost blanket. This to me is probably one of the most important slides because if we can control the volume of water coming off of the slope or off of our soil, do we have an erosion control problem? If we have no runoff, we have no soil movement. And this is really important, that ability to absorb that sponge of compost that's on top of the surface. Not only that, when we control that runoff, we also control the release of nutrients coming off of, uh, of slopes. And here's four different studies, two of them by Dr. Fawcett, showing the effectiveness. There's one uh, in 2005 where he compared it to hydromulching, where he got a 58% reduction in total nitrogen compared to hydromulch. Keep in mind, hydromulch oftentimes has soluble fertilizers added to it. So that most likely explains a lot of why you're getting less here. But 98% nitrate nitrogen reduction over hydromulching, 80% total sediment, soluble phosphorus, 83%. Very, very effective at reducing pollutant loads coming off of a site. In addition to that, there are other contaminants besides nutrients uh, and sediment. You also have, uh, it's extremely effective against bacteria, uh, total E. coli and E. coli, a 98% reduction on average. Metal, heavy metals anywhere from 37 to 78%, depending on what metal you're dealing with. Hydrocarbons like oil, diesel, 99%. Uh, really, really shines when it comes to hydrocarbon removal from uh, runoff. Now let's go to this, uh, the Caltrans study, which to me is one of the finest pieces of work I've seen out in the field done here in California by Scott Dolan of District 5. And it was a two year observation of compost performance, comparing it to conventional uh, uh, hydro seed, BFM actually, bonded fiber matrix, uh, hydro seeding, as well as other uh, typical uh, straw wattles and what have you. Here was the site, the Prunedale Improvement Project, 45,000 cubic yards of compost covered over 108 acres. So this is a pretty significant trial. It's, to my knowledge, it's the largest evaluation I have seen, certainly in California. Here is, here is the slide that just uh, blew us away. There was a five inch rain event over 24 hours at the site back there in 2011. And on this slope, this was highly erosive soils. They put a compost blanket with seed in it and they put berms in there rather than uh, socks. In this case, they just blew berms. They'll work, but on slopes, the berms tend to kind of uh, flag off. Uh, the, the seed in the berm actually helped hold it in place. And then they compared it to a BFM application on the bottom with uh, straw, straw wattles. And you can see that because of the high erosivity and the massive amount of volume that the conventional BMPs, uh, BFM and, and fiber rolls could not hold up to that much water under these extreme conditions with highly erosive soils. The blanket literally lost no erosion and was extremely effective. And here's the blanket with some blown straw. They also used that, that was six months later. Uh, all of this had gotten that five inch rain event. It was very effective. Here was a case where right after the storm, they had BFM'd the left with no compost. And then there was a blanket on the right that they just went ahead and oversprayed with BFM. And you'll notice this is a great example and it was done in, unintentionally, but without the compost, it just simply, the BFM could not hold up to that much water that fast coming at it. And with the addition of that blanket, the BFM did just a great job right over the top, held everything in place. They got literally no erosion, even without the vegetation. Here's what it looked like later, compost blankets, hydro seeding and quar netting. They did use quar netting on a lot of the blankets because of uh, their concern with wind erosion and other, uh, other factors. But um, to give you an idea, because of these results, this is the kind of an impact that kind of study has on Caltrans's use of compost in their, uh, in their designs, and it continues to uh, climb. There's a bill, Assembly Bill 2411, that actually mandates that Caltrans is to use compost wherever possible for stabilization and uh, to remediate fire damaged soils along freeways. We talked about qualities, SDA, seal of testing assurance issued by the US Composting Council. 
This is a standard practice with all Caltrans projects. You, they will not use any product that does not go through this technical testing, which includes uh, pathogen reduction, weed seed, and then a, germ, a, a, germ, a germination study. Uh, and not only do they germinate seed in, in the material, but they also evaluate its vigor. So this is a really critical component of all compost that you use. It's not created equal. Make sure you get it tested and, and people that you're buying from can provide that kind of information. These are Caltrans's recommendations uh, based on this two-year study. Compost blanket with chlorinating, very effective. Aggressive erosion control material combination for large steep slopes. They install over compost berms when used. Compost blanket with blown straw, very reliable, more cost effective than punch straw. And erosion control material combination that can be used in a variety of conditions. Hydro seed applications, apply under the netting and over the compost to protect seed and provide good germination conditions if you are gonna use it. In many cases, they didn't have to. Consider including seed and compost applications and reduce application steps and equipment. And then the last one, they did incorporate compost into the soil. They ripped it two to, two to three times the depth of the compost. So for example, if you're applying one inch of compost, then you're gonna to wanna to rip the soil and incorporate it down two inches to three inches and it was limited to slopes that were four to one or flatter. They also use compost berms uh, without the sock. They use as linear sediment barriers on slopes in lieu of fiber rolls, outperform fiber rolls hands down, but they have also moved a lot towards uh, biodegradable mesh compost socks. They install these at the toe slopes in lieu of fiber rolls or sill fence, excellent at capturing sediment because they actually filter that water through that coarse material. And then eight inch compost socks in vegetative swales and drainage uh, ditches. Uh, they install in vegetative swales and they'll add the seed to the compost to vegetate the sock as well. And then fiber rolls, they are used primarily only for temporary sediment control applications. The beauty about compost blankets in, in every sense is that they truly are a permanent best management practice. They're one that will keep giving you benefits time and again. Here's Caltrans summary of that two-year study. Accelerates the natural systems required to restore sites. It built healthy soils by mimicking the natural environment. There you go. <laughs> mimicking biomimicry, mimicking nature, yet just can't beat it. Provides optimum vegetative growth, protects the soil surface from splash erosion, has a high water holding capacity. Here we go again, that water absorption capability, which slows down and disperses the energy of the sheet flow. No runoff, no erosion, no pollutant discharges. And then high carbon to nitrogen ratios result in low discharge of nitrogen. And it has a natural biofiltration characteristics. All in all, a huge success for Caltrans and for the state of California and a uh, a BMP that you will start seeing more and more because of these results. Now I'd like to talk to you about Dr. David Crone's study that was commissioned by CalRecycle back in 2011, 2010, 2011. And it's, it's entitled The Impact of Compost Applications on Soil Erosion and Water Quality. And it dealt specifically with remediating fire damaged soils with compost blankets. And the impact of the compost applications uh, were very effective in reducing water runoff. On average, the runoff volumes were reduced by 80%. Now, this is on fire damaged soils that tend to be hydrophobic. When a fire occurs, it releases certain volatiles and we, we get a hydrophobicity of the soil surface due to the heat from the fire, meaning the water will not infiltrate effectively in that soil. When that first rain event occurs after a fire, you get tremendous amounts of water, which is what happened in Santa Barbara, which resulted in horrendous uh, death to that community and, and damage. These compost applications not only are effective in reducing the soil erosion, but uh, on your, your sediment, total dissolved solids and suspended solids, they were reduced by 95, 65, and 94 percent respectively. What happens when you stop, you reduce water runoff by 80% and you reduce sediment loss, which carries contaminants from a fire damaged soil into the water supply? You essentially clean that soil up. There is no better BMP, if you will, for 
remediating fire damaged soils in a compost blanket, which will break that energy, covers that hydrophobicic layer of soil so that the water can truly infiltrate rather than shed off and carry all that soil downstream. Very, very important work. I have copies of this uh, presentation. It's also available online through Cal Recycle and, and through uh, just Googling it for it. A very detailed, under read, I don't think most people even know the work was ever done. Uh, the other two items I wanna share with you before we close here and then open it to questions is, uh, there's a manual called the Sustainable Site Design Manual uh, published by Forrester Press out of Santa Barbara that is based on the research and, uh, and the work of Dr. Britt Fawcett on 24 compost-based sustainable management practices. And again, the emphasis on sustainability because of what compost can do to sustain and regenerate soil. And then another one that I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are unaware of that they did a fabulous job is the US EPA's compost blanket publication. And I have copies of that digital that would be glad to send you. It does about four pages of summarizing the importance of particle size, how it works on slopes, uh, everything you need to know about compost blankets from the US EPA. They highly encourage people to adopt this technology. And unfortunately, it's just not being taught enough for people to even aware that, uh, be aware that it's around. So let's summarize here what I've told you, biomimicry and why it's important. The closer we manage landscapes to their natural design, the more we save on energy, inputs hard infrastructure and financial expenditure. Working with nature takes advantage of services that are both free and efficient. This is what we lack when we choose to go towards a more gray infrastructure solution versus a natural green infrastructure solution. We lose the free services, the, the water absorption, water conservation, soil biology, biodiversity, uh, heat island reduction, and of course, carbon sequestration. We lose all of that when we choose to go another path. The choices we make on what BMPs we choose to use make a huge difference. It's the foundation of sustainable management practices. What would nature do? No waste. I'm just, we saw this earlier, biofiltration and water absorption, which is such a big part of post-fire remediation. Green infrastructure, habitat creation, native plant and animal maintenance, biodiversity and restoring that natural carbon cycle and getting that carbon out of the air and back into the soil. So when we work with nature, the closer we manage our landscape system to their natural design, the more we save on energy required inputs and financial expenditures. Compost can preserve topsoil and prevent erosion. We've been proved, it's been proven time and time again, the research is irrefutable. It purifies literally soil and water the way nature does by managing nutrient runoff, improving salinity, filtering stormwater runoff, binding pollutants in soils where they can be broken down. Do you know that when we bind diesel fuel uh, and oil in soils, the microbes convert it to CO2 and water? That's, they use compost facilities when there's an oil spill off the coast, they get the organisms from a compost facility to remediate oil spills. That's how effective this material is. And then it suppresses plant pathogens by providing food for these microbes. And we'll be talking about that at 12 noon on how the soil food web enhances the entire soil biology because that's what you're feeding with compost. You're not feeding the plant. You're feeding the biology of the soil, which then in turn feeds the plant. So when you work with nature, you restore soil water quality by revitalizing wetlands and invigorating depleted lands. And you remediate soil resources by managing the problem organics in contaminated soils. Here's why Nora Goldstein, editor of BioCycle, the preeminent publication for composting and recycled organics says about working with nature. The primary limitations on organics use are not technical. We've figured it out, folks. If watershed managers and landscape contractors, for example, become enthusiastic users of organics, the only serious boundaries will be, will be the limits of our own imaginations. And we find that most of the applications we're 
designed by people out in the field solving problems. So working with nature to rebalance our environment. And if we do that, we'll have healthy food and healthy families and happy families. And we'll be able to grow in our gardens with good soil and have landscapes that support uh, future generations and the sustainability of the quality of life that we all deserve. And with that, I'm gonna open it to questions. Got about another 15 minutes, John, I believe, and I'm gonna leave this up. These, uh, this is my contact information for any of the publications I showed you. I'm more than glad to forward them to you. Or if you wanna call me and talk about anything regarding what I've covered, be glad to talk to you. All right, well, thank you, Craig. Uh, great presentation. We do have some questions, so I wanna yes. uh, put it out there for you. Um, so a question, uh, someone had commented that they were seeing mentioned to yard waste compost and they're asking, okay, what about uh, compost from food scraps or manure or a mixture of these with yard waste? Um, is any compost better than no compost at all? Is the question. And may maybe you can even talk about um, uh, feedstocks for the uh, compost. That's a great question. Uh, feedstocks for compost are absolutely critical. What you start with, Typically, a food waste or a manure-based compost is going to be much higher in nutrients, but you may not want that in stormwater management. You may want that in an organic agricultural setting where you can incorporate into the soil at a, at a reasonable rate. The other thing about compost is you, this is why you want it tested, because depending on what the feedstock is and why it has to, the SDA program requires it being tested on a monthly basis. And that's because the feedstock changes over the course of the year, which will change the quality of the compost. And so you want to know what you're putting down when you put it down there and you want it to be as predictable as possible. We're going to be talking about that at noon, why uh, compost is not classified as a fertilizer because it's not predictive because it's a very general uh, term that refers to decomposed organic matter and it can be anything. And if it doesn't have the quality or was not composted correctly, it can be detrimental to your soil health. Uh, organic matter can work both ways. You have to learn how to manage carbon and manage that material in order for it to be effective. So I hope that answers your question. That food waste, you're going to see more of it being composted. It's going to go to a, what we would think of as more of an enriched compost that you would want to use to uh, support plant growth or blend it in with the yard waste compost to, to lessen uh, the nutritive value and, but still feed the soil microbiology. Okay, well, great. That answers it. Great. Um, uh, I actually had a question about the linear sediment controls. I, I know you may mention that. I've seen uh, John McCullough talk about it. Uh, I've saw it in the Caltrans, but, to install those, what, what are, is there a trick to this? Does it need to be keyed in? Does it need to be secured how, uh, somehow? Um, is there a limit to the steepness of the slope where you can use a compost uh, berm uh, as a linear sediment control? Uh, what do you know about that, Craig? Um, yeah, and it, it depends. Obviously, we have a lot of slopes in California and um, compost socks per se uh, are heavy by design. Uh, and because of that, they have good soil contact. On an impervious surface, as John, uh, you've mentioned in the past, uh, you really want to weight them down because you don't want any undercutting wherever possible with a filtering device like a compost sock. So you want good soil contact, or if it's on an impervious surface, you want good weight on top of that to, to seal that surface, the interface between the surface and the filter media. Um, on slopes, uh, Filtrix finally came out with a five inch diameter sock and, and they, they produce it both in a biodegradable mesh as well as in a, a, uh, a polypropylene mesh that lasts longer and you can cut that and remove the mesh. But it's made it much easier to uh, install on slopes. One of the advantages of all of these uh, compost socks because of the additional weight is you don't have to trench them in on slopes in that. Um, normally the diameter of the sock or of the berm, and the, the berm is great if you're on a flat area with sheet flow. It'll work just as well as a sock. The, the problem with a berm is if you get a concentrated flow 
hit that berm, it's going to blow it where the sock contains the filter media that you're, you're asking to do all the work for you, the sediment control in that. And so um, you, if you vegetate the berm, uh, it may hold together, but again, it's not as strong, doesn't have the tensile strength of a contained uh, berm inside a sock. So typically the larger the, the diameter of the berm or the sock, the larger the quantity of water it can filter over time. And you will always get some ponding be, behind the, the, the sock or the berm, which will slow that water down, which is what you wanna do. You wanna take energy out of the flow and then allow it to filter through the berm, filter through the sock where all of the work takes place, where all the sediment, the majority of the sediment is actually captured and where the contaminants are contained. And then after that, they let the microbes work with it, or in the case of uh, real heavily contaminated areas, you may even want to remove, remove the sock and actually bring it back to a compost facility and have them recompost it to degrade the contaminants in the, in the uh, mulch itself. Okay, and I think I was referring more to the berm because uh, it was in some of your photographs, uh, the Caltrans study, they were using berms, not socks. And there's been, um, uh, the last several uh, um, seminars I've seen this summer, even on, on uh, composting, there's been a lot of talk about just using berms on, on slopes. So uh, is there a cut sheet that you know of? Is there uh, uh, some sort of standard that has come out yet uh, for using a berm on a slope? On a slope, um, the CASCA fact sheet on, uh, on socks includes berms. Doesn't really focus a lot on the slopes. What Caltrans did is if they're not using a sock on a slope uh, and they're gonna do a berm, they're gonna blow a berm on it, they will, I don't know if you noticed, they will cover it with a rolled, a, ro a, a quar blanket, a quar netting. They'll actually net the berm on top of the berm. It's a bit expensive, uh -huh. but that's how they'll, maintain the height of the berm so it's doing what it effectively has okay. to do. Keep in mind on slopes you don't really need, you're just trying to slow the water down ultimately, so you don't need a lot of height. That's why a five inch compost sock will perform quite well because it actually filters the water. It'll be equivalent to an eight or nine inch uh, fiber roll. Okay, the, and I, th I think that goes a long ways towards answering another kind of follow-up question. What does a compost berm look like? Uh, does it look like a straw waddle, but uh, filled with compost? Actually, to answer that question, Lisa, um, the next workshop at 10 o'clock, and just a little secret to you all, it's already on there. It was pre-recorded with John McCullough, so you can watch it anytime. Um, it, he actually shows uh, some of these berms in, in some of his video clips. So you can, you can take a look at that. And what, what people have done with the berms is they, they produce a little attachment at the end of the blower truck hose that's kind of a triangle that shapes. So they'll, they'll put, put it on the ground and it'll shape the compost as it comes out of the hose into a little dike, kind of a pyramid shape. And that's how they'll install it, or you can do it by hand, but that's the fast way to do it is they, they've actually have uh, these little attachments, metal attachments at the end of the hose that shape the berm as they go along. And you can add seed to it and vegetate the berms. Yeah. Texas, uh, of all the states, Texas is probably the champion for the use of berms on level ground along the freeways. They've done hundreds, if not thousands of miles of compost berms along their freeways in Texas. And so there's some really good research uh, and, and work done in Texas on the use of berms, much more so that, than in California. Okay, here's another comment uh, or question actually. For those interested in using compost blankets for the first time, do you have recommendations on considerations in designing the project and creating a scope of work? Yes, um, I would recommend that you go to uh, Cal uh, Filtrex's website under their design manual and Dr. Fawcett has published at no cost all of the specifications, what you need to do, how to design it, CAD drawings, everything on uh, compost stormwater blankets, as well as 24 other compost-based applications. So that's available at no cost on the Filtrex website or purchase the sustainable site design manual from Forrester Press and it's all there in a non-proprietary uh, manner, all the specifications for stormwater blankets, 
uh, biofiltration cells, you name it, 24 different applications. Riprap, some people use uh, compost blankets in riprap and they call it riprap grouting. <laughs> they literally <laughs> blow seed and compost in between the riprap. It, the, the, we, uh, the plant grows in between the riprap and adds more filtering uh, ability to the riprap for fine sediment. Huh. So all kinds of different ways to use compost, yeah. And, and Michael, I think another place I would check would be on Caltrans. Caltrans has developed a lot of uh, uh, scope of work and, and um, uh, design criteria and has done a lot, as Craig mentioned, on uh, installing compost blankets and compost berms. So I would look at their, their uh, specifications as well. What, one other resource, uh, John, that I forgot to mention that's extremely well done, and that's Cal Recycles Compost use toolbox where they break it into different applications for different environments and they provide all the research and the references on how to get more information for each of those it's called the calorie just google calorie cycle compost use toolbox and it's uh done by brian larimore he just retired but his last uh, contribution to the industry was to put this beautiful uh, website together with all these resources available easily. Yeah. Okay, here's another question for you. Uh, are you aware of any test of compost blankets at the bottom of swales where flows tend to concentrate? Uh, at, uh, so at the bottom of the swale, uh, well, basic, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question completely. Are we talking about a retention basin uh, using, or a rain garden using compost? Is that, I, I think, um, if that's the case, uh, yes, uh, some of those applications, uh, rain garden or, or bioretention basins using compost are covered uh, under, by Dr. Britt Fawcett uh, on the uh, Sustainable Site Design Manual and on their website. They'll use socks a lot of times to contain it and vegetate it. So, so uh, compost used in concentrated flows is always going to be somewhat of a challenge. A blanket um, will, will be, yes, yes. Uh, what, what I've seen done in concentrated flows is they'll use the socks as, as devices to slow the water down and create sheet flow. They even have a, a level spreader where they'll level, level the sock so you can take a concentrated flow, spread it along the length of the sock, so it sheet flows over the sock and then into the blanket. As long as you're, long as you're dissipating the energy from a concentrated area to a wide sheet flow, you're okay with a, a blanket, but that's, that's the real trick. And that's the art in using compost, is understanding how to use various devices in that to create the sheet flow that you're gonna, you're gonna need in order to not move that material down downstream and cliff this might not be exactly what you had in mind but we actually had a uh, workshop this week uh, called uh, more bmps from uh, the construction sandbox and we show uh, a device that we have uh, worked on called a treatment train and we actually will have cells of compost where we are putting concentrated flow through it but as craig just mentioned we lock in that, that compost cell with compost socks on both sides so that it's locked in, that we're forcing the flow through it to get the benefits of it. Um, many times in our treatment train, we're actually using the compost to treat pH. That, that's our main reason for using it. Um, oh, here's a clarification. Bottom of swell, uh, meaning flow through channel at the top of the watershed, AKA a zero order channel. Uh, typically above where a channel would normally start moving uh, uh, bed load, but may be vulnerable due to disturbance. Yeah, again, I would use some sort of uh, some sort of uh, stormwater diversion devices to slow that water down at, in a situation like that. You, you just need to be able to manage the energy in that water coming out of that swale. That, and that's the key. And you can use these berms. In, in a sock form to literally dissipate that energy and create the sheet flow and, and, and move it downstream. 
All right, these are great questions. Uh, yeah, if you got much. one uh, last question, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask it or type it in real quick. Now, Craig, I want to point people to your website. I think your website is awesome there at San Pasquale uh, uh, Valley Soils. Uh, all sorts of compost products. In fact, one of the best selections I've ever seen. Uh, tell us a little bit about San Pasquale uh, Valley Soils. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, absolutely. In fact, I just launched a blog on our website. It's called Dr. K's Corner, and I'm going to be covering subjects, and we'll even be posting these videos on that uh, blog site, uh, where I will educate people on a regular basis on all the various ways and problems we can solve using compost. And so uh, we provide uh, a service to the community by collecting a lot of what I, I like to call feedstocks that are bioresources. I don't like to call it waste because it's not a waste. It, ideally, if we're working with nature, nothing goes to waste. And we collect these bioresources and we grind them, we compost them, we go through a very elaborate process of meeting the criteria uh, for the U.S. Composting Council Soil for Testing Assurance Requirements. And then we test that material and we grind it to various sizes. We have uh, mulches with, with fines in it to feed the soil. We have, we have mulches that are, are less, uh, less uh, fines in it. So in case you have an area where you don't want the fine compost uh, in a landscape area, it'll be less dusty to handle. We have the manure base, we call it Valley's Best. Uh, compost that our organic growers particularly and nurseries will incorporate into the growing media. And then we have the, uh, what we call the planter's blend, which is that half inch minus three is the half inch minus material that would go into a blanket in combination with our, our, uh, our uh, California native compost with mulch. So we'll blend, we can do different blends. And then we have a whole range of other other mulches and products and aggregates for the landscaper so that uh, we truly try to be a one-stop shop where they can come in there and get the job done and not have to go to multiple sources. So uh, San Pasquale Valley Soils has been around for over 10 years. Uh, we continue to expand and grow and offer new services. We're gonna be looking at biochar and in integrating that in. We're looking at new products. These are all some of the things that I'll be working on as we expand our services to the community in uh, the, the uh, Southern California area. One other thing uh, that came up last time, John, I, I wanna bring it up again, was the cost of a hydro seed application or hydro mulch versus compost blanket. I, I verified some of the figures and uh, a compost blanket, because it takes longer, there's more investment in producing it and installing it, runs about 25 to 35 cents a linear foot. I'm not linear foot, square foot, square foot, 25 to 35 cents. A hydro mulch, hydro seed application will range anywhere from 10 to 20 cents a square foot. So we're about two times, maybe a little more. It really depends on whether you, what kind of seed you're adding to it, how much guar you put into your hydro seed mix. Uh, so they vary, so I give it as a range. But typically you're gonna pay maybe twice as much for a blanket and you're gonna get about 100 times more benefit from it on a long permanent basis than you would with just going with a temporary BMP like hydro seed. And, and, and I, I should uh, correct that. Hydro seeding, if you can, uh, as, a, as a Caltrans says, if you can apply it to a soil that's healthy, that has organic matter and it has a compost component to it, it does become a permanent BMP when the vegetation establishes itself. So in that respect, working with healthy soils is your best approach toward hydro seeding. And you can get to that healthy soil, that sustainable landscape via compost. So those two together go hand in hand. I am, I am all for hydro seeding. It has some tremendous applications, but it needs to be married with healthy soil. And right. that means organic matter. All right. Well, thank you, Craig. It's been a great presentation. Thank you for uh, uh, talking to us today. And uh, the, everyone has their, your contact information there. And yep. I recommend they join you at 12 noon for a virtual lunch, right? You can, That'll be a good one. We're talking about yes. the Soil Food Web. 
Yes. Soil food web during yeah. lunch. <laughs> and so thank you everyone for attending this Stormwater Awareness Week workshop and being a part of this event. You have a good day and we'll we'll talk to you later. Thank you.